good evening and welcome to icpa clinical series today we have the seventh episode and the theme of icpa clinical series is to solve one clinical challenge in each episode and we make it a point to get the best speakers the experts from their domain area and we try to solve clinical challenges so that practitioners can get help on the challenges they face in their daily practice today it's my great pleasure and privilege to have my best friend a great clinician academician researcher and a great friend dr vivek hegde to speak on his topic of expertise that is incorporating loops and operating microscope in your daily practice dr vivek hegde is a microendodontist par excellence he has represented india at various prestigious platforms like american endodontic congress ifes seoul apec new delhi and many more dr vivek hegde is an acclaimed academician for over 25 years with more than 100 publications and contributions to 10 books currently he is the vice dean professor and head department of conservative dentistry and endodontics at M.A. Rangunwala College of Dentistry, Pune. He holds Masters in Dental Lasers from the University of Vienna. He is a faculty for lasers in Vienna and an adjunct professor at various colleges in India. Dr. Hegde is the president of Indian, Soci Indian Endodontic Society and also the president of SOLA and the director Indian Board of Endodontics. And most importantly, He is presently the CEO of White Arch Dental Center, Pune, a beautiful center, and One Dental, an online teaching platform. So, friends, let's have Dr. Vivek Hegde, and Dr. Vivek Hegde, the session is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Rajiv. It's always a pleasure, and uh, thank you for the invite. Thank you, Shristi, and the entire team also. Uh, it's a good topic that it chose, and I think uh, I've been working on magnification for the last uh, two decades. My first exposure happened in 2001, when I possibly gifted myself a pair of loops. Uh, it was not very popular in India, and I got it from this one of my good friends. Happened to come to India, and I got it from there. I must confess, which I always tell you, you know. uh just because the pair of loops came to me i think the way of working changed for me from that day i think i started improving my work because i became a constructive critic i started looking things in a different way trying to make it even better so this whole presentation will i know it's a very long presentation i'll try and compile it as much as possible in the next 30 35 minutes and what i'm trying to say here is magnification is here to stay in fact there was an old article i read you know it said uh, the change of tomorrow is here today and this is a old article and ever since there was no looking back and i'm going to show you some good examples it's a purely clinical presentation so you'll get to see the entire overview in this one video this video just goes to say and show you where all you could possibly use a microscope or a loop how it could improve in different aspects you see the reference also it is meetings like this exchanges in conferences where people get to see each other's work which possibly will intrigue each other to make you feel better so different procedures and most of these are mine and this endo and restorative so the diagnosis of fractures the restorative dentistry and the modi can be restored the calcium hydroxide coating at the apical third A placement of the finish lines, getting to the crown for retreatments, placing of a bioceramic material, a 
using of lasers for crowd lengthening procedure, removing excess. So basically, there's plenty of uses. It's not only for endodontics or restorative dentistry. In fact, this has become a new way of your life in your clinic now. For us, it's been always there. I see a lot of people getting into the act of magnification. This is, of course, with microscope. And these are today's time, the testing time, COVID times, where we're using all those gears and then using a microscope or at least a pair of loops. Let's see where, what can help for people. Now, if you see this, this is the basic I expect from anybody to use. A pair of loops is so easy to pick up. Microscopes definitely has a learning curve. It's minimal, but start with a pair of loops and then graduate upwards to a microscope. If I show you a position statement, this is not new. This came in the 90s. It's close to 30 years old. And then they said, as an endodontist, for endodontists, it's must to use a microscope because your clinical outcomes are much better. That's true. But what I'm going to tell you is, it's not only for endo. For endo, of course, you see a variety of reasons. Different cases of mine treated different times. Treatment, retreatment, whatever they may be. Advanced work like this. This is a case of dense, dense invaginitis type 3. If you see the year that we treated, it was 2009. So it's also about 12 years old. But only why I'm not going to talk about the case here. All I'm going to say is seeing is believing. I think if you can see it better, then only you can do it the best. So this is one case if I get even now with maybe even 12 years or 13 years post experience after this case, I will still not be able to do it good if I don't see it good. For which you definitely need magnifications. You need microscopes. You need advanced work. That was about my speciality. Can you use it in another speciality? Of course, yes. Now we see here that a paper has been published. You can follow this as a free download. It can be used in restorative dentistry, endodontics, which came in commonly, I said. But of course, I've seen some good implantology work being done, some good perioplastic surgeries being done under microscopes. Raji will agree with me. He's a very good perioplastic surgeon. So you know exactly what I'm talking. One good case that convinced me. One of my first cases in 2007-8. This was in the college. We were doing a periapical surgery. Didn't even prepare the site well. And I went to give a new type of an incision. I used to like this scalloped incision. But I realized the depth of the sulcus was deeper. So the attached gingiva bit was not enough. So I said, no, I'm not going to give a scallop tear or a loop portion bean, it's called. Full thickness, I was not keen because there was crowns here. So we decided to use something known as a Peter Volvert. That's called papillary preservation flap. But if you see here, the first flap itself where we gave there, out here, that flap went wrong. It tore because of my orientation going wrong under the microscope. I was a little worried because it is in the aesthetic zone. But believe me, I'm going to show you the next picture. At four times, eight times, 16 times, or 24 times your normal eye. That's how the microscope gets bumped up. I could challenge anybody if you could tell me where I gave the incision. That's how beautiful it approximates, it heals, and so forgiving. This only happens because we use magnification. We approximated well. We use a 6 0 suture. We give small bites. Everything, the plaque retention was less. The healing was miraculous. These are a few things that actually convinced me yes, microscope is here to stay. So think about this. I can give plenty of examples where it's been used not only here, world over, peer reviewed, with a lot of analysis on meta, and you can give this. I'm going to show you another good example. This is not my work. I have the habit of just quickly running through everything. Here's a case on a lateral incisor, a restorative job. 
This is 2x is 2 times your normal eye. It still looks good. I'm going to bump up this. There's a restorative dentistry down here. When I bump it up to 4x, I still can't see much. When I bump it up to 8x, now I see the unfinished composite. I bump it to 12x, see the irregular surfaces. And I start seeing something else. At 20x, you see, you get to see the bristles of the brush out there. The bristles of the brush, which may be called as a camel brush, that they used to paint, got adhered in the resin composite and got cured. Now, such kind of dirt or even debris is also out here, up there. See that? So you see there are various places where you will find a lot of dirt or debris. This is 20 times your normal eyes. I'll show you another picture at 20 times your normal eye. It's not wrong when good aesthetic dentists tell, we call the patient a second time to finish and polish the restorations. I do the same. Because you need to spend a good 25, 30 minutes at times to get that super fine, glossy, polished layer. We used to call it BLB layer, but that was referred to mostly amalgam restorations. But that super gloss, super fine, super polished surface to remove all these micro scratches with the finishers it's only possible with high end of microscope or magnification. But this is 20x. Now 20x here. See the surfaces. Now I go back to what I showed. 2x. Everything looks good. So if you want to be at that level, if you want to up the level of your greatness, jump into the act of magnification. This was microscopes. Here, we also call patients of veneer placements for finishing and polishing by using the 12 number BP blades or the uh, any of those soft drills or flossing and everything. A small video to show here how a 11 number BP blade is so useful for interproximal areas. It's commonly said that you know you end up staining the uh, ceramic. I don't think ceramic can get stained because it's highly fired restorations. What gets stained actually is the interface or the resin cement that stays over it. All I'm asking you is, take the 11 number blade and start trying to pull it away from the gingiva. And that's how you possibly can clean the surface. Maybe you're not on the same day because you don't want it bleeding. You can call it after a couple of days. That's how you remove the interproximal. 11, 12 number BP blade, the Bart Parkers are my favorite. I don't like to use any drill to make the surface get lost. Coming back to the topic again, loops versus microscopes. For all of you who are watching me, I know the ratio between loops and microscope is in huge. It's in hundreds. So it's easy to get. Get in a pair of loops. My take is start with the 2.5x. It's good enough. Here you see I have using, I'm using loops of different companies because I conduct workshops. We have training programs. So I've collected a lot of loops from different companies. I have a 2.5x, I have a 3.3, a 3.5. I know Dow Doctors using 4.5, 5 and above. 5 and above is not needed. It's mostly for people who are doing standing dentistry or people who nobody does standing anymore or people who are using on an OT table like a surgeon. They would go for a 6, 6.5 sometimes. I know a plastic surgeon who goes that way. But then he's standing. And he's not using his spectacles, like how we're using his specs. He's using a headband. Because that anything about 3.3 or 4 gets very heavy on your nasal bridge. You'll end up getting fatigue. You'll getting tiredness. You'll getting headache sometimes. You may get nausea. All these things may happen. So my take is, for beginners, start with the 2.5x. It's more than enough. Why? Because there are two things to understand in a microscope. One in, in a magnification, I'm sorry, in a magnification. One is called field of view. Second is called depth of field. Field of view is nothing but how wide, how narrow. In the 2.5, you get a full mouth view almost. And that's exactly what I want to orient myself in a consultation procedure. This is the first pair of loop I have bought from the US. My friend gifted me. I told you I asked him to get it for him. For me, sorry. And that was the first gift that I gifted myself on my birthday rather. If you ask me, this is 3.5x. These are like surgical telescopes. 
anything about 2.5 plus, you can call it prismatic. The prisms are there. They're very good. The depth is good. The field of view is good. The clarity is good. Everything is good, except it can get heavier. I didn't have a microscope in 2001. And then I said I was going consulting. I wanted to possibly do some deeper procedures like alleged treatment, maybe a broken instrument, maybe a perforation repair, all those. So we picked up this. But today, if you ask, in 2015, I picked up another pair of loops from the same company, Zeiss. Now, of course, they were in India, but with the headlight. You see a 3.3, a 3.5, and now you have a 2.5x. 2.5x is one thing that I always use every time. It's there in my neck. I just put it up, have a consultation. If I want a microscope, I have a ceiling mount. I just pull it down, check, and take it back. So I play around with my loops and my scope. But one thing, if you see a difference here, in the 2001, there was no light. In the 2015, I've incorporated a light. This has made things different for me. It's a white light, a bright light, more than 50,000 lux. And it almost follows your eyeball. What I don't like in the dental chair setup is what? I am sitting at 9 o'clock position, 10 o'clock position, 11, 12, 1, whatever I choose. And the chair light is coming from the front. The chair light is on the patient's mouth and I am sitting behind. We are not matching. What I'm seeing, there's no light. Then I'll use my mirror. I'll do indirect vision, indirect reflection, indirect illumination. And we're trying to play around. Why? Today you ask me, my chair light is not put on. If at all, if I'm buying another chair, I won't buy with the light I feel. This light is brighter than my chair light. It's following my eyeball almost. Almost. I'll tell you why. And I get to see what I'm doing directly. So if anybody's buying a pair of loops, don't miss buying a pair of light. Light, you can buy a cheaper one, I don't care. But loops, do not compromise. Go for some of the best. I know this question will come to me when we take a q and A. I'm sure Rajiv has been, been, they've been pouring questions on him. He will ask me, we will discuss there. So that was the chair with the light I said. So this is where we started. And the loop with the light, I'm sorry, loop with the light. And you see a filter above that? That's for composite curing. What happens is, if I use this light and I don't get that time to have that command set of the restoration, it will set in no time. So please use a filter. So in Indian conditions, I'm saying Indian conditions, because in India when products come, so many things get minused for costing reasons. So in Indian conditions, you may not get other filters but the one filter that a microscope company will sell you or the loop company will sell you is an orange filter. That's a must because every dentist will use resin in his life for some part of the procedure. It might be splinting, it might be restorative dentistry, it might be any other. So that's when you need the filter to come in so that the light doesn't cure the work before you even carved it or shape it up. Have I used microscopes? Almost everything that's in India. It has been in some workshops, some colleges where I've gone for demonstrations, some private clinics where I've worked, my own college and my own practice. So these are the various microscopes that you get to see in India. So all of them I've worked. So I can possibly be one of the best critics to tell you what's good and what's bad. So this is the ideal posture. This is my clinical setup post uh, Pre-COVID times, before COVID times. One point I want to cover here quickly. When you do magnification, what happens to your vision, you know? You see the unaided, unaided eye, it's 200 microns, the resolution I'm talking. And now I'm bumping it up from a low mag of 2.5 to the highest. I'm going fast on the slide. So suppose I go to the lowest, bottommost portion. It's a 20x. At 20x, my resolution is 10 micron. You know what that? I'll give you a clinical example. This is a line drawn on a piece of paper kept on the table. This is a table of my clinic or the college laboratory. Now, you see the steel table. On that, there's a paper. And on that, there are two lines, not one line. And those lines, I must confess, was drawn on the highest magnification. Again, to cut the story short, 
I'm going to show all the six magnification together. This is a global microscope where we had two, three, five, eight, 12, 19. So it's six steps. So we'll only take one step here. This is a 19.2 times. These two lines were drawn with a ballpoint pen under the highest magnification, very close to each other, almost touching. It's practically impossible to draw with a naked eye. More than that, you know what? Why did I call it a ballpoint pen? In the ballpoint pen, there's a ball in the center of the nib. So when you press the ballpoint pen, the ink is released around the nib. So the nib will create a void on the line. That's the exact line you see in the center. You see a void in the center and the line that's drawn on either side is because of the ballpoint nib. That's the kind of specificity you can get with microscope. You can go that close if you want to. That's one of the highest magnification though. But this is only helpful for a microscope and not a loop. Few things to take here. Now I'm going quickly on another clinical example. I'm working on a microscope. I prepared a finish line for a veneer and see there's a burr running on this picture. I don't remember the day when I didn't use a microscope or a loop that I not touched the gingiva. You'll end up nicking it or bleeding it. And see this picture, this is real time. There's no hit on the gingiva because that's the kind of specificity I mentioned. Finish lines is what the lab requires, a good positive seat, and it's so easy to create. I'm going to play a video here. After applying the retraction cord, we are trying to do a finish line. So nicely, so smoothly, and well defined. One of the best compliments that I get nowadays, or since some time, is my labs are happy with my finish lines. I don't know the day when my gingiva didn't bleed when I was using retraction cords. Today I'm using high mag. I can see what I'm doing and see when I'm packing the cord. There's hardly any bleeding because I know exactly you're tucking into the earlier areas without even giving excess pressure. Of course, this is an edited video. I've run the video faster here, but see how neatly it goes. And here's another example. This is not my case. Like I said, I like to view the cases. A good veneer was placed on a patient of ours by another dentist. But I saw something that is greenish, bluish at the gingiva. You know what happens? He was not wrong, but he didn't finish the case well. I go fast. At 8x, I could see something. I take my DG16 Explorer and I try to pull it out. There's nothing but an elastomeric impression left behind, which caused the recession of the gingiva. Very sad. This will not come back. I'm sure Rajiv as a periodontist will agree with me. A recessed gingiva is that much more difficult to pull it back. I know you have this uh, lot of surgical procedures you'll do possibly by taking uh, flaps from different areas, but that is experimental in a different ways. Not needed. It's neglect here. If you have a microscope, you can't go wrong on all these things. I know you have to inject the light body into the system there, but when you take, it can tear. That tear left behind the thing, and that was not taken out. Okay, loops is like normalize. You have to squint, okay? That's why I mentioned earlier, you see, you get a little headache, little nausea, little sort of uh, dizziness sometimes. That's because if you're squinting for maybe a long procedure, like in one hour or two hours, it takes time for your body to get acclimatized. Even your normal eye, if I have to look at you, I have to squint, I have to look at anything rather, I have to squint and that gives me a feedback. That's when I squint, it meets at a point. It's called a focal point. But my normal eye can focus at infinity. So I can look as near or as far as I want. That's the beauty of my eye. In the loops, you can't do it. There are binoculars that are directed in one direction. It will go and meet at a fixed focal length. That may be 12, that may be 16, that may be 18 inches or whatever, you know, based on your construction height. But in the microscope, you know what the beauty? You look through the microscope, the microscope will give the convergence angle to you. That's the beauty. That's why on a microscope, you cannot possibly get that fatigue, that headache, or the heaviness of the loops on your nose, nasal bridge. Because microscope is a different part. So there's no squinting in the microscope. You're looking straight, and that's the best beauty of it. 
few more things. When I talk about loops, like I know there's a lot of people listening to the lecture who want loops, at least, and you must go for it. You can go for a head, head worn one, but it's like tying your head. I would definitely ask for a, a spectacle one. But there are two types now. One is called a flip up, which I always showed you. The other one is called TTL, called through the lens. In this picture here, where it's written prismatic, that's called a TTL. So this is a TTL. So what it means is, in the TTL, uh, you have these binoculars that are soldered into your spectacles. They're laser welded maybe. These cannot be shared with anybody else because that is your IPD, interpupillary distance. So what I'd say is, if it's only for you, you can go for it. But if you are wearing a specs, then every time you change your eye power, the lens needs to be resoldered, which is another thing. Like every two years, I know people will change the number. So that may not suit you. The easiest one is a flip up. So you decide what you want to go. You can go for a flip up. You can go with through the lens called TTL or you can go with the head worn. All three are okay. Galileans are low mags. Prismatics are higher mags. That's the main difference. So we leave it at that. Now I said about the field of view. This is what I meant. 2.5x, you see, like a loop, is full mouth. In microscope, 4 becomes 3 fourth mouth. 8x, 16x, 24 comes closer, 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 half the tooth. So the field of view starts reducing. But in a good microscope, the depth of field will also be good. That's important. So quickly an overview of what's your magnification. Do you want a low mag? Do you want a mid mag or a high mag? This classification is a clinical one. And it's mostly for microscopes. Now, suppose I'm viewing all the teeth. Like we're doing multiple restorations, bleaching, multiple endo, orientation. I want to inject the patient, a, any other procedure, or a full coverage, crown preparations. It'll be foolish for me to go at highest magnification, like say 20 times, and keep jumping from tooth to tooth. I want a wide angle. I want parallelism. I want orientation. Take low mag. We don't need to prove anything to anybody. There's no heroic or heroism here, please. There's something called mid-mag. Most of the clinicians under microscope, we work mid-mags. But high-mag is one where you take for photography. Photography is good or for spot checks or a little bit of work and then come back. The slightest of the movement of the patient, because we're working on a mobile jaw of the patient, they will move, they breathe. So it's not like an unconscious patient in the OT where the tissues are fixed and they're using. That's all okay for them. That's why possibly in dentistry, people are running away from microscopes more. Because in microscopes, nothing is direct. It's all indirect vision, indirect illumination, indirect work. So just an example, low mag. See low mag, wide angle. I'm working on five or six teeth. These are finishing of teeth preparations for repeat job. So it's nice to see a parallelism for me. Quick look before we put a retraction cord or finish lines or whatever it is. And that's how it means. A mid mag is what I always use, mm -hmm. like my endo work. I want to see quickly the isthmus. There's still some uh, debris there is not clean, so I need to work on ultrasonics. Maybe that's what I look at. High mag, are these like a deep level dentistry. I want to go deeper. I want to see the apex. When I said apex, it has to be a straight line. If you have a straight line, that shiny spot you see is the apical end. You can go as far as you want. And that's the beauty. There is a bioceramic restoration. We placed biodentin there. And that's the uh, final uh, obturation at a core built up. So I just want to show you three months pre and post. And see, it's responding, it's behaving. The lesion that was big in size with an open apex. This is a dense evaginitis case. It's mostly seen in premolars. If the right has left has to have, it's a complement. Take it that way. So you need to work on this. Nothing of gutta percha techniques will work here. Open apex, flare apex, wide apex, oblong apex. Please use bioceramics. No other way, please. We've tried all of that. Coming to microscopes. How do you sit? Why do you sit this way? Because microscope is not, not just to see. We as dentists, I always say this, you know, we work six hours a day minimum, 25 days a month minimum, 12 months a year, and then I don't know how many more years. If you have to go year on year for a lifetime, the one problem that we all face sooner or later 
is lower back pain, neck pain, which is what? Professional hazard. So why don't we sit straight? And if I'm using a loop, or if I'm sitting, that's my fixed working distance. I can't bend. I have to sit at that distance. My focal length of the binoculars or the microscope or my loops cannot let me bend. That makes me sit the way I'm supposed to sit. And how you're supposed to sit? This is here. I'm mean, working on a loop, the headlight, see the uh, filters there, my assistant there, and this is how it is. Having said that, with the loop, you'll still end up bending a little. Microscope, you cannot bend. You know why? Because you sit and look through the binoculars, you can't come out of it. You have to look through that. With the loops, you can still bend your tilt your head a little. That's the thing. So loops are easier to adapt and start working. So please use them. Yeah, this is my college picture, the department. All I'm saying is this, what we've been taught in second year. First and foremost, keep your feet flat on the floor. Thighs parallel or a little inclined. Back has to be erect. You have no choice. Neck can be minimally inclined. That's exact. To add to that, if you want to get ergonomic chairs with the hand rest and support, nothing like it. Because in dentistry, is all about fine motor skills. Please lock in your gross motors. Which means your shoulders, your elbows, they're all locked and stabilized. Your fine motors are what? Fingers. A little bit of wrist are accepted. And that's when you can maneuver it well. Like the way we've taught you instrument guards and rest in schools. That's exactly, we've not taught you external maybe. That's, this is what we mean. And we learned it later also actually. So this is what I wanted to understand. So how we could get a healthy posture, a spine, and ergonomically perfectly balanced to work. You can possibly work long hours with this, believe me. Like I said, there's a learning curve. It's very small, but it's very, very long way. It carries a far way. My assistant, see their stools. They also hold suction. They also need to stabilize. You can't expect an assistant to holding a suction with free hand and not poking the throat when the patient looks at your eyes and you look at the assistant's eyes. It's impossible to hold for one hour on a free hand. Tell them to take some rest somewhere, on the chair, on their other hand, whatever it may be, if they're not sitting this way. They need stability too. So that's what you do. So that's my assistant working and I'm working under the microscope and that's exactly what you mean. There are different chairs available which are ergonomically designed. One last use of a microscope and then of course I will be concluding with some concluding remarks because there's so much we can speak about it. I said so much about microscopes, what's good and what's about loops also. But here it goes. I said in the loop, the light follows my eyeball. That's true. But here, sorry, I, the, uh, light, I, the loop's light was above my eyeball. But here, you know what? Wherever the light source may be in the microscope, when I'm looking there, there is a light at the site of work, which is called shadow-free light, which is also known as unobstructed coaxial illumination. In simple words, when I use my loop or my chair light, my hands, my gloves, my instruments then can still cast their shadow at the site of work. In a microscope, you will get a shadow-free light. There's no shadow. There's no superimposition of anything, no matter how deep you are, provided your lights are good. You can go for a white light, which you must go. The clinic has to be white light. The chair has to be white light. The, everything in the loop light is a white light and the microscope is a white light. There's no halogen anymore in the dental clinics. And the light, it started from metal halide, came into LED, now you have xenon. You decide what you want to buy. Everything costs money and everything is available. This is what I want to tell you. So here are a few things before I conclude. If you're using a microscope, there are a few steps you need to understand. This is like how you adjust a microscope. You want to wear your specs or you don't want to wear your specs. You want to open up the eye cup or not open up the eye cup. These are for better ergonomics. And then possibly you'll end up using something known as your IPD, where you adjust the turntable on top, move the binoculars to suit your eyes. Because in the college, we have 18 postgraduate students. Everybody may want to use it. Everybody's IPD is different. So whoever sits on the microscope has to first adjust. Unlike in my clinic, in my room, 
I'm the only one using it. So I do it once, it's always there, unless somebody cleans and disturbs it. It's hardly a disturb. And then there's something called as a par focaling, where you need to adjust the focus of the microscope from highest to lowest so that you don't lose focus, the centricity, and the perfect, accurate, crisp image that you want to get. That's called par focaling. And then, of course, you have a few more things. How to adjust to fine focus with a video scope or with just a fine focus. And sometimes you want to see a lateral tilt. There's something called as a Mora interface. So you can use it for a lateral tilt. So these are a few of the adjustments that you need to do if you're using a microscope. But having said this, microscope users may be very few. Loops are plenty. So my only take to all of you is, please get into the act of microscopes and learn the art of indirect vision. Please buy good front surface mirrors, not ray surface mirrors. And maybe in the question answer, I will start how to, how you could start using the microscopes, where you could start using it and all those things. Only what I would say is, these are some of the pictures from my postgraduate students then, they're all endodontists now. I've seen good endodontists buying microscope for status symbol. They say, there's a microscope, but you know what? My chair light is not as bright. I'll use a microscope light and they push the microscope up and the light, there's no chair light, you see, it's focused. This was just an imitation done here. So you are using a microscope for the light. You're wasting a mean machine. Don't waste it, please. Seeing is believing. In fact, I've seen doctors using like this. Sometimes you have trying to look into the screen while working. The microscope is focused, but you're not looking through the lens. That screen out there has got length and breadth. That's a 2D. It doesn't have depth. When you look through the binoculars, you're literally in there playing around what you want to do. Try getting the maximum advantage of the me machine. And one more tip I want to say is from another thing. Learn the art of indirect vision and try and understand one thing. The entire one hour that the patient is under the microscope or two hours, whatever you want to call, all that the patient gets to look is this. You're working from top. Respect your limitations. Respect your patient's limitations. It's good once in a while for you to examine yourself also under the microscope. Assess your work. Like I started this you know, presentation by saying, I am confessing again. My work has only improved because I became a constructive critic with a pair of loops, now with the microscope. Even till day, I do the same thing. If it's good, I pat my back. If it's not that good, I would say I can be better tomorrow. So this is one review. One of my friends sent me this uh, image. So if you see on a microscope, how bright, how sunny, how clear it looks, and how gloomy it looks, how dark and how dingy it looks without a microscope. The choice is yours. With that, I think I'd like to thank the entire team of ICPA, Rajiv, my good friend, who is the main part in this entire series, Shruti, and the entire team for inviting me here for this presentation of microscope or magnification based dentistry. Thank you so much. And my class sign is here. I always like to end my presentation by signing off thermoplastically. A big thank you to all the listeners and viewers here. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. It was amazing. And uh, the way you said, you were already doing great practice. You were already doing good consulting. But the day you started using magnification, the whole thing changed. And uh, being a periodontist, you showed the example of how you can prevent perioplastic surgeries by yes. taking care of tissue injuries. Because once in those areas, the precision starts, we may do a surgery, but the wisdom is in preventing those injuries, preventing the trauma and uh, tissue retraction. And uh, one more thing, what I could feel see here and uh, get convinced about was in implantology we have this complication called as cement induced inflammation and cement induced tissue loss 
peri cementitis you can call typically you know seen in the cement retained implant restorations just because a few particles of cement got retained and you could not wash it away and that causes an irreversible reaction with the tissue so if you have this microscope you can prevent such big catastrophic you know cascade of events so i think there is a lot of uh, you know preventive value for this microscope and in the end the doctor is happy the lab guys are happy and the patient is super happy so i think there is a great need to introduce uh, magnification either loops or microscope in fact the microscope the way you have described microscope can can be a great changer for many practice almost all practices so that was a great presentation you took about 35 minutes but the knowledge you shared in those 35 minutes immense immense so uh, i think we can go to the question section a lot of registrations a lot of questions have come yeah 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 rajiv i would like to add about you total implantology uh, yeah. one good indication what uh, some of the endodontists or who have microscopes are doing is including me that the screws get broken in the implant and then you're not able to remove it so we have some ultrasonics we have the magnification we know how to hit it straight and perfect without disturbing the inner lining of the collar or whatever you call in the implant you know yes so the impression yes. surface is not disturbed much so the screws that got broken i have actually removed some of them uh, sometimes yes broken screw in an implant is a nightmare i know i know yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i think people will come to microscope after trying their all their techniques and if yes. you are able to remove it with the microscope they'll be the most delighted people like that that's yeah. a great example thank I you thank you so much friend. yeah it's happened before that's why because you talked implant suddenly that came into my mind yes yeah okay okay so there are uh, a lot of questions i think many of them have been already answered in your lecture so first question i'll take is what magnification is good to start with if he is a beginner what magnification is good to start with okay the minimum magnification that you get is about 2.5x from any company okay it's 2.5x so i would say for a beginner or a, somebody who is doing gel dentistry 2.5x is good you don't have to go for higher magnification and in dentistry okay. 3.3 is the next best step you don't go higher because then the field of view reduces if you're an endodontist like say you're doing consulting work and you say you want to go to 4 i can understand there are some in dentistry using up to 5 but that becomes too much you can't work for long hours it gets heavier it gets a little too tricky on your face you know that's what but more than that rajiv what i would say is we need to buy the light the light is also a game changer if yes. you have a little issue on money don't compromise on the loops buy one of the best loops but the light you get from the lesser companies from the lesser countries which make you know but it's a white light a bright light and a cheaper light okay so even in lights you can get a corded light a cordless light and you can get from uh, the high end lights can be as much as about uh, 80000 to 1 lakh rupees the lesser lights can be about 10000 to 15000 rupees it's still usable you know it's rechargeable their lithium ions their lightweight all that is good these are all happening now and a lot of companies are giving you the added advantage of adapting okay so that way you know it can be retrofitable which you can buy later if you don't have money please i always say rajiv this in my life you know this is my rule i follow must have nice to have need not have you okay. make what is that you know so must have is my loop or my scope yes. need, nice to have is what my light maybe maybe filters i'm not doing surgery i don't want a green filter i only need a composite filter i'm not doing lasers i don't need a laser filter today if i'm doing buy or else okay next year i buy the next i want a camera my add ons i today i want microscope let me master my art then i go for documentation then i go for a camera i go for a video camera still camera make put screens these are all add ons nice to have there are some things need not have you don't need to go for the gizmos that you don't need so this is what i feel you know yeah i think that's a great lesson for the beginners must have nice to have and you need not have and if there are financial constraints at least start with must haves and slowly you go on adding nice to have things great great point great point okay then there is a question does magnification improve or worsen operator related musculoskeletal problems in dentists who have pre existing orthopedic issues it's a very good question i know of friends who had this trouble 
of course by using microscope your musculoskeletal problem which you already had may not get corrected for which you may have to see your physio you may see a chiropractor or whoever okay but once they straighten things up you can hold on to that because you can't go wrong by starting it right i was told by rajiv the audience is mostly young it is like learning driving you know you see a person who, like some of us we've learned driving in school or college when we just got out by because of that interest and we are good at driving i've seen people who drive much later in life who learn they will hold the steering and you know they won't have the free movement the way they want to go that's how it is we learn microscope much later i took 6 months to learn it you only take 6 weeks if you are youngsters because you are very very agile your movements are very very faster we may get slower and sluggish over years the interest everything is changing for all of us as we get older now if your musculoskeletal problems are still existing please do dual approach but you need to keep seeing somebody also maybe do yoga maybe do stretching maybe do some therapies but with a microscope 100% i'd say you cannot invite trouble if you already have a trouble you need to sort it out but with loops you still can bend like i said you're wearing a pair of loops i bend like this i'm still seeing what i want to see but my neck is still bent in a microscope i have to sit so one tip one more tip raju i would add here is generally you know what happens when you sit in the clinical chair you will make the patient comfortable and then i will go to sit why is it so i am working 6 hours 25 days a month 12 months a year and my lifetime my patient even if it's a full mouth case you know how many hours i always tell this maybe i'm taking 6 months for the full mouth maybe i'm taking uh, uh, 40 hours not more than that full mouth i'm talking i may take 12 15 visits for the patients that 40 hours is one week of your work if you're working 8 hours a day 6 days a week you're done 48 hours that full mouth case the patient even becomes right so you see a patient only that less you understand that one full more than talking so if you don't spend time on yourself on yourself invest in a good pair of or a good dental stool for yourself the chair that is showed ergonomic design chair because that will help your lower back you need an s shaped spine not a c shaped spine you can't hunch back but look at any dentist you know what you should do tell your assistants to click pictures without telling why at random and see the pictures at all angles other than to walk around the room and take pictures when you're working at random you'll be ashamed to see what we are doing that's my story also earlier i'm telling today i'm sitting straight because microscope makes me sit so coming to the point you make yourself comfortable first what is your construction height feet flat sitting straight my hands straight all those things then i bring my patient to me that's my position rather than, okay i understand you have a compromised patient somebody who is medically compromised who can't sit properly who can't sleep properly do that for them that one patient you bend it's okay but all the other patient can bend for you right when i say bend means they can sit the way you want them to make that as an advantage you can't give everybody comfort you will suffer your working years will reduce in life and the peak years of yours when you peak at 45 50 60 is when i see some dentist good friends of mine not able to do dentistry it's sad so take it seriously it's not just about looking seeing viewing illumination it's about yourself standard of care for the patient is the highest of course but more than that it's for you for your back for your ergonomics take care friends thank you so if there is somebody who has got orthopedic issues musculoskeletal issues and he has identified them in the early earlier you know as early as possible in his practice the first thing he should take care of is his spine back posture ergonomics so he should invest in a good microscope good chair so i think these things will come in must have and nice to have is start his orthopedic consultations yoga and all those things so i think here also the same thing will come must have uh, nice to have and need not have need not have is all those compromised postures and wrong positions yeah. so i think that's a great advice uh, let's move to the next question how is apex locator used when you are using microscope in endodontics i don't know what he wants to ask I, but i think you can understand what is going uh, yeah say. see apex locator is used the same way how it's used but you know the only difference being you cannot come out of the microscope go into the mouth and come back 
maybe if that is what you're asking you're glued to the pair of binoculars it's that couple dancing moves which means your assistant knows what's your next move the couple dance your assist your other partner knows right which is your next move that's exactly your assistant knows what's coming next so your assistants are so well trained that my the lip clip of my uh, the lip clip of the apex locator my assistant puts under the rubber dam i don't do that the seeds wet it's put on the opposite side of the face where there's no rubber dam uh, where there's no uh, tooth involved suppose suppose i'm putting a rubber dam clamp on the right side tooth on the left side tooth goes the lip clip which is moist because moisture is more there okay then i put the file my assistant has got two types of clips one is a file clip or second they have a small stick which they can touch the file and it will beep that sound is enough for me to understand am i near apex at apex beyond apex with a long beep so i will start adjusting i let just the stop all that i can see when i remove they bring an endo block next to that they will measure it for me and say 21 mm sir i'm done got it so that's how you do you can't come in and out in and out that is wasting time so you are so delegating and doing a teamwork yes it has to be dentistry forget microscope forget magnification gone are the days where you open the shutter and you close the shutter all by yourself i am not asking have a show practice have at least practical practice which means at least two people in the practice at least one in the practice abroad i've got a good clinics there's only one assistant but the assistant does everything you know what the clinic is closed in covid times i practice that my clinic is closed my assistant the doctors or patients will come and press the calling bell we open the door we take one patient inside now here i have a receptionist or somebody else opening the door but abroad the same secretary or the assistant who is the secretary will open the door take the patient inside because there one goes and other comes and there's time in between generally nothing overlaps okay and this assistant that one assistant is also an assistant also a helper makes coffee tea everything clears everything so you just need one good assistant who can be yours for every reason so think about it that way if you have the money if you have the time if you have the energy to put 10 people inside in a big team do that that's okay the least i said like i said you have to buy a stool for yourself i just remember one more point why dental companies don't sell it i don't know the chair companies i'm talking they sell a basic stool doesn't make any sense the round stool is not good with a round small back it doesn't support anything if you have the money buy the best dental chair buy the best dental stool because you're giving the patient comfort also like i said patient comes for a short time for you even if the full mouth doesn't matter if the chair is lesser spend equal amount for yourself on a stool that's what i meant so apex locator revising again you can't do everything on your own if you're using loops you can still wide angle in a micro microscope it's not wide angle and you don't come out of the binoculars that's my request great great okay out from your experience which one you find as the most user friendly loops for me i would say that there are two types i told you headband i don't like i tried it before as a trial i didn't buy one let me confess i asked the company to show me if it suits me because i don't have spectacles so i can go for both i can go for even the ttl called through the lens or i can go even for the flip up but practically speaking in the flip up as my work is over if a patient wants to talk to me i can flip it up and i can still talk to the patient in my through the lens i am peeping through my you know binoculars to the patient or i entirely take my specs up that disadvantage i found personally yeah but having said that ttl some of them really like it because it's focused only for you it's not anybody's my flip up is what i can adjust my ipd and that particular loops anybody in my clinic can use it if i am ready to give it or like a college where we have only five loops but we have 10 doctors working anybody can pick up that adjust that and use that's an advantage in a flip up in the through the lens the ttl you cannot so these are the two different main major differences now i don't know what suits you in, on your needs you have to balance that please great mm. i think you have also second thing is through the lens 
when you're buying, see that the company measures everything very good for you. You can go to an optometrist, ophthalmologist, I don't know, get your IPD best corrected with the tilt position because there's going to be a tilt. You're going to have a healthy little bit and you're looking down, right? You can't go so down, so back also. Little chin up, of course, it's called a chin tuck. That's the position we sit. But when you sit with a construction height, construction height is what? Your arm and your hands, how far they go that way. That's the construction height. That construction height to the triangle that it makes from the eyes to the work to your, uh, you know, uh, sh shoulder, your elbows to up there, your shoulders. That arc that it makes is called a construction height. That's the distance of the lens that you'll buy. 12, 16, 18, I told you examples, the distance. If a short person buys 18, he'll be stretching this much. If a tall person buys 12, he'll be bending. There's no point of ergonomics then. You're spoiled it. So see your construction height. The companies will help you on that. TTL has to be measured. It cannot be soldered here. It will be going to the company back and coming. So very few companies accept a TTL. I'll put it that way. If I give you 10 good company names, three or four accept TTL. You know why? Because it's not easy to make it. There's an extra money again involved in that. They will again charge you five or 10,000 rupees more for soldering that binoculars onto your lenses. And if you're wearing spectacles, that needs a change every time. So it, it goes on and on. So practical, simple is flip-ups. Great. So the next question is, how do you uh, change your protocols when it comes to pediatric patients? Any Magnetic patient, person. any patient, first and foremost, you know what I do? We have a habit of giving a good time on consultations, which I learned from, see, when I went consulting, right? I did a lot of consulting for long years in... Uh, Pune. I said, one day when I have my clinic, my clinic came much later. So when I said, one day when I have my clinic and I have the money to start my clinic, what not to do is what I learned from all those clinics. What to do, everybody does. Right? Somebody practiced very well, but they didn't have a good setup. Somebody couldn't speak well. Somebody did not speak well, not could not, did not speak well. They were rude. So whatever it made, it's personal choices. It's personal behavior. I only made myself clear, okay, this is not what I want to. So I used to take a small book in my pocket and make my notes. So in that, I said the same thing. When a patient comes to me, you ask a question on pediatric patients. In my consultation, I want, I always make this joke. I want to have a patient with a Julia Roberts smile. When I say Julia Roberts smile, it's not the smile. It's the mouth opening. Molar to molar. Because your work becomes easy. If somebody's got such a small mouth opening, you're wasting your time. They're making you fatigued, tired because of just, they're not opening well. You can't work well. Somebody's got a macroglossia. Somebody's, you know, all those things complicate your work. So in the consultation, I will classify my cases again, uh, Rajiv. Simple case, not so simple case, not at all simple case. <laughs> it is not about only the tooth. I have tooth factors, anatomic factors, patient factor. That is also a factor. If patient is very, very giving types, they're trying to help me. I'm more than happy. I may not even want to charge them more because I know I'm clearing it out on the first day. Simple cases, one visit. Not so simple, two visit. Not at all, maybe three, four visits. You're wasting your time, right, for nothing, which you could have done in two visits. So you have to balance your life that way also. So I would classify my patient there. So coming to pediatric patient or any uncompromised patient who can't possibly sit medically compromised and all those types, you know, you need to understand this way. Uh, you should need to tell them that uh, this is a procedure that you'll go. Sometimes I give a bite block and see see if you can hold this. You have different sizes. I just need to see if you can hold this as I'm checking your mouth. Because I need you to open tomorrow for a close to one hour, suppose. So the inventory will disturb. Everything is gone. I can let you close your mouth when there's no rubber dam, maybe when there's consultation, maybe when there's some other procedure we're doing. You know, all that is possible. So you need to talk to the patient. It is difficult coming to your question when it's pediatric patients. Again, behavioral science, child management is what we've always learned. It is mm -hmm. not easy. My most difficult teeth, I don't treat pedo as much, but I get reference from my good friends for you know what? Young permanent teeth, non-vital, open apex. Oh my God. This is a terrible thing to do because below curvatures, you have to seal their apical third, which you can't see possibly. It work tactile, mouth is small, the kid is not agreeing to sit there. So it becomes a little tricky and difficult sometimes. So you need to talk to the family, 
you know, to get them into things. We don't want to start the day, first day of my work. I may start a little bit, make them adjusted to the place, comfortable, all those things. Sometimes the advantage is, you know what? If you have a screen on top and the patient is seeing the screen, they will want to see their work as, a, as you're working. But, and also, like I'm improving a broken instrument on a patient who's even very good, suppose. But they shake. They're shaking. So they don't want to shake. They want to help you, right? So then it's really good. But at the same time, you have a patient telling, talk, I don't like to see blood. I don't like to, I don't want dentistry. Play national geography. How does it matter? Change the channel. You know, it's possible. So that is your choice. So having a screen right above the site of work for the patient to see what they want. You can give a cordless earphones if you want. That's their wish. So these things are possible today. But yes, having said that, pediatric patient or any patient who's uh, in uh, what you call medically compromised or anything else, uh, there are issues. But that is a small factor. Okay. Okay. There is a live, uh, there's a question from the live audience. What is the difference between TTL and Galilean loops? No. Uh, again, you're mistaken there. Uh, Galile the lenses come different types. Like the Galilean lens, the capillary lens, the prismatic ones and all that. Basically, it's about the make of the lens. Like I gave you a simple example saying, if it is less than 2, 2.5x, they generally go for a general lens called a Galilean types. When they go higher, then it becomes prismatic and all that because there are prisms placed in between. Now, TTL is a different concept. TTL is, you can use the same lens in flip up or in TTL. TTL is through the lens where you can take it up. I think somebody was trying to sell you a TTL, which is prismatic. That's why I think, or a Galilean type, I don't know, maybe Galilean. So they're trying to sell you a 2.5x, which is Galilean, which is TTL, possibly. So this the lenses which are prismatic, Galilean, Keplerian, all I said, they come in all. What you need to know is, do you want a flip up? Do you want a TTL? Do you want a headband? That is what your choice. Based on the magnification, like as a 2.5x, it becomes Galilean straight away. Higher you go, you can't use Galilean. The principle changes then. That's what it means. Great. I think pretty much we have covered almost all questions. And there is this is the last question I want to take. Someone who wants to buy a microscope, and there are multiple companies, multiple uh, brands. If they have to look at the specifications, which is the first one they should look at, which is the next one to look at, like if I go by the same classification you said, which is the first thing must have I should look at out of all the properties, specifications described, what is nice to have and what is those, you know, gimmickry which I can, you know, avoid and uh, end up buying the right product in my budget. Yeah. Okay, I'll make this question a little different in the sense that uh, before I give you a specs of a microscope, ask the company one question to all the companies. Okay, I'll tell you this way. When I went to take my house loan or a car loan or a, in a clinic loan, they confused me. Rate of interest is this much, that much, and I could not understand. Reducing balance, some said fake, some said monthly, some said yearly, some said quarterly. I only asked them one question. I'm taking one lakh rupees loan. I'm taking you five years. What's my EMI per month? It can be 20%. I don't care. Tell me the EMI amount. The same question I asked all the five banks. Whoever gave me best, I took that. That's, that's what I understood. Because you are reducing, I don't understand. So all I want you to ask the company is one question. Every microscope company asks them, what is your field of view and what's your depth of field? There are charts, there are graphs, there are diagrams. Tell them to post it to you. If you don't understand, post it to Rajiv or me. We will help you. Okay, that's all what you need. You will understand for yourself which has got the best field of view, minimum to maximum, which has got the best depth of field. When I say depth of field is, you know what? At the highest magnification, not at the lowest. Like I said, there are five-step magnification, starting from two times till about 20 times. Just an example. At 20 times, at the highest magnification, I'm moving my fine focus and yet not go out of focus. You understand what I mean? Suppose I'm seeing my root canal. I will take my gross focus straight to the middle third of my root canal. Then I can't keep moving my microscope. Then I move my fine focus. Now I want to go to the apex. I also want to come to the coronal one third. So when I move my fine focus, 
If I lose my focus, then I have to move my microscope down. That means it doesn't have a good depth of field. A good depth of field is one microscope where I kept at, say, in the middle third, I can still go to the apex, I can still come to the coronal one third, maybe to the chamber, maybe to the crown, to do a core built up also, without moving anything. That's a microscope which has got the best depth of field. And try and buy a microscope which has the maximum, which needs a big budget. Mm. Understand one thing. So it all depends on what your budget is. If you are a 5 lakh budget, a 10 lakh budget, a 50 lakh budget, or uh, anything else. There are microscopes for every levels. But my last point I would tell here is, when you buy a microscope, buy once. I know a lot of people, I'll buy something cheaper. Maybe, you know what, uh, when I make more money, I'll buy another one. Then the second, first one, what you bought is gone. Buying a microscope is like getting married to it, okay? And you can't even divorce it after that because it's lying there. Okay, that's what I would tell you. So it's simply wasted. It's a dead machine. And nobody will buy back from you. Mind you. So buy a microscope six months later, six years later, always I say this, don't, don't worry. Buy a pair of loops today. When you have good money and you're convinced, do some training, follow some good opinion leaders. There are so many in this country doing good microscopic dentistry. Follow anybody you want. They're ready to help you. And then take it up from there. If you ask me, when you buy microscopes, buy with a white light, a must. No yellow lights, no halogen lights, please. Why, is, why say no yellow lights and only white light is because we follow sunlight. You have to have something called a 6000 Kelvin as a temperature. And you know what? When you take a shade matching, you always want to call the patient in the morning, right? It's not possible everywhere. Shade matching is taken at 10.30 in the morning, northeast direction, in the garden. If I ask Rajiv in Mumbai, where do you have garden? That's the story, you know. You cannot do that. 10.30 in the morning. Which patient is going to come every time at 10.30? So here, under the microscope, it's a white light. It's a sunlight with the temperature. I can take a shade at that light, under the microscope, any time of the day. That's why I'm telling white light. Even your clinic light, get Philips, get Cisco, get which company you want. Get color corrected light. There are temperature lights, white lights. Your chair, dental chairs have got white lights. But ask for filters always. In my clinic, I've got white lights, but when I use resin composite restorations, multiple when I'm doing, we use dimmers. Others, before I say Jack Robbins, it's set. My composite is set. I have to keep removing it, not filling. I can't get time to carve it. Okay. So that's what I meant. So these are a few things. Again, in cities, real estate is an issue. I don't, there are different mounts in microscope. There are floor mount, there's wall mount, there's ceiling mount. I prefer a ceiling mount. You know why? When my work is over, I throw it up, I'm free. My real estate is free. If it's a floor mount, it's eating up my space next to my chair. My assistant can't stand. You have to keep moving it. Ceiling mount is fixed for that chair. In the college, in the hospitals, in the same floor, huh? not other floors. You can move it. It's got caster wheels. From one chair to another. I can understand all that. Colleges have enough real estate. Hospitals have that. We don't have the space. So for us, a ceiling mount or a wall mount is definitely beneficial. So my personal choice would be ceiling mount. Now I spoke about a light. Buy a microscope at least with five steps. Decent. There are three-step microscopes. There are six-step microscopes. The more your, your wish, but less I don't prefer. There's only three steps. Your limitation will work, but not bad. Buy white light. Try and buy, okay, microscope are three types. Straight microscopes are the ones we used in our you know, pathology microbiology. Inclined microscopes are the microscopes which came from, say, uh, ENTs or uh, ophthalmology sometimes. We need inclinable, that binoculars can go 0 to 180 without you moving, which means if I stand and watch, I can still watch, I can sleep and watch, I can still watch because that is going through optics to my eyes where I want to see. When I do fixed or inclinable, when I move, everything is moving this way. So I need a part called inclinable, which moves for me, which costs additional money. Let me put that. But in dentistry, most are selling inclinable. But if you try and ask what is cheap and best, you will get suffered. This is the, this suffering will happen because in dentistry or in life, what is cheap is not best and what is best is not cheap. So there's nothing called cheap and best for us. Let's be very clear. Okay. I think you go for cheap. It's your choice or go for best. 
So I said, go for best. Take your time. I have taken time. I didn't buy the day one, of course. It's taken me years to buy something what I wanted. And still, there's so much in my bucket list. I'm filling it up. So get to the best. A five-step minimum magnification, a white light, a ceiling light, a one with the best depth of focus, a good field of view. Try and buy something called a variable focus if you can, which is a fine focus extender. Then a lateral tail called a Mora interface. If you have money, buy everything. Then like how when Rajiv and I were discussing, you can go add-ons. You can go for the mount because camera is just not a camera. You have to buy a mount for a camera. That mount costs a couple of lakhs. And then comes the camera. From there comes the wires that go into the TV or your monitors. And then you need uh, the recording device or sometimes the camera you have all those today. All those things. Software sometimes. Many things. So these are all add-ons. This can come later. Networking. They all can come later. First is viewing, learning. And the last point is if somebody wants to learn, go stepwise. I always believe in this. For me in Endo, it has always been my first 100 teeth. I still work on extracted teeth. When there's an extracted teeth, like a third molar extracted in the clinic, I, we don't throw it. In my free time when the patient is cancer, I pull it sometimes in the mood, I play around with it. It teaches me so much more. If there's a failure of a tooth that you've done, I do postmortem on that. I stain the tooth, I disc it. I, I want to see why. Have you missed canals? Are there a fold? Is there a flare in the canal? Has there been cracks? So many things we learned. So when I see a radiology x-ray, or a clinical picture, I correlate to the tooth that I, you know, we lost once. So it makes me more mature. It makes me more better. So I want you all to start understanding this way. So start basic, work, direct work, forget mirrors now, extracted tooth, work on models, 3D models, direct work. Then start working on typodonts, phantomets, mannequins, on some preparation. It may be as good as simple uh, class one, class two cavities. I'm okay. Then go for scaling polishing procedure. That's the best thing you can learn. You know what? First, labial, direct, with water, without water. Because when you use water, the field changes. Illusion effect, water. You know how it happens. Then, lower labials. Upper palatals, easier. Because we always use mirror for the upper teeth. Then, lower linguals. Lower linguals or the lower quadrant is the most difficult under the microscope. Because nobody does indirect. We all do direct. We want to go behind and start looking under the teeth and inside the teeth. I don't know how, but we do it. So my request is use a mirror lingually and I'm telling you tomorrow, just go for yourself and do this small test. Keep the mirror, the lingual surface, come front, look into the mirror, you're looking indirect vision of the lingual surface, the lower anteriors. Take a scalar tip and try and do a prophylaxis. When your hand is going right, it's actually going left and you will start laughing. Why can't I go right? You want to hold your hand and take it here and you will laugh at yourself in spite of working so long in dentistry. You have to learn it still. The hand-eye coordination to the mind through the mirror will happen. It will take time. The day that happens, microscope is yours. The same thing for endodontists who are doing root canal. Keep the mirror of the distal marginal ridge. Put the file in the mesobuccal canal. You are putting actually in the mesolingual because you are looking in the mirror. Once in a while, peep directly, look there. Peep directly, look there. Keep doing this till you get that synchronization. The day it happens, Microscope is yours. Don't buy microscope today. Start with loops. Start with naked eyes. This is not taught in schools. That's why anybody who buys microscope or loops will always tell upper is very easy because I can. Because you always work with mirrors. Lowers, nobody works with mirrors. Why? I don't know. I didn't maybe. I learned it. But today I know. It's possible. So just learn this even before a microscope. You may take some time to buy a loops maybe. Start tomorrow. Indirect vision in... And you get a good pair of front surface mirror, it throws 40% more light from the chair, from your loop, whatever you want to call it. Sight needs more light, right? That's called indirect reflection of the light from extenders. So there are a lot of small things you can take. So learn this even before microscope. Once you've done the scaling procedures, then go for basic work. Labial work are easy. Composites, bleachings, veneers, they're all easier. A tooth preparation, you have to cross a line angle, is not easy. Direct work is easy. Start anterior root canals, start maxillary, then go for lower anterior root canals or molar root canals under the microscope. Retreatment surgicals are that much more difficult. So anything direct dentistry is easy. So step by step you graduate. That's why I gave you six weeks or six months. If you're a serious customer, I'm telling you, it's like going to the gym, I feel, you know. Every year we'll make a resolution in New Year or your birthday, right? And then you pay for the year. 
you make him it's a social responsibility i say you know every year we pay this right corporate uh, social responsibility every for 2% we all of me and we don't do it we do it for a day for a week for 3 weeks i would say do one week do two if you do three weeks you won't stop it will still continue but before that you go slipped the same is the story of anything in life same is with loops and microscopes i think with this welcome to the world of magnification i want all of us to enjoy i wish the dental council of india or any other governing bodies take this topic seriously and make this happen not after bds not what after bds like how rajiv chirkupi teaches it is what in bds or during bds second year when you start pre clinical labs is the time if colleges don't give you you invest in yourself the faster you buy the better person you will be the best dentist you will be take this from me and you'll remember me for life thank you so much amazing amazing so you told both the things the machine and the man okay yeah. and how they should gel the learning curve and actually you told the steps how to go through the learning curve and how it how to make it easy for yourself so that you can master the entire microscope and magnification sooner for yourself and for your practice what a great session it was you have cleared all the doubts and uh, i think there are so many questions but you have covered all of them everything has already come in your original content and in other uh, other answers and i'm really happy the way the this session the entire session went and i'm so thankful to dr vivek hegde for taking this topic and finishing the entire complex science and the applicability in the practice within 30 to 35 minutes and answering all the questions and uh, thank you for great uh, for the audience for, for coming in great numbers registering and actually participating with their great questions and i sincerely hope everybody has got what they were looking for from uh, this session and i would like to tell you that in the coming two days tomorrow or day after tomorrow we will be we will be coming with five point summary of this lecture will be sending to all of you of course you can watch them on the icpa facebook page and we'll also be putting up the link of uh, link of the recorded lecture we'll be sending it on whatsapp if you are interested you can connect with us we'll be communicating to you this five point summary as well as the recorded lecture link so that brings us to the end of seventh episode soon we'll be coming up with the eighth episode of icpa clinical series each episode one clinical challenge so before parting i would like to thank once again dr vivek agade great academician researcher and uh, clinician and great friend i wish you all the best and uh, goodbye everyone take care of yourselves great friend comes first rest is next bye thank you are you very words are you very words thank you thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thank you everyone